This is MTG Burgeoning, and in this video we are going to update and upgrade our Child of Alara EDH deck. Thank you for joining us for another installment of the Up and Up series. Today we are updating and upgrading our Child of Alara EDH deck. Before we start wheeling and dealing, however, let me take a moment to inform you that down in the description of this video, you will find a link to this build's deck tech. You will also find a link to this build's deck list, up to the moment deck list, I might add. In addition, one more link right underneath that, and that would be to this build's video primer series. We have a whole mess of cards going in. That means a whole mess of cards are coming out. But we're going to do so in chunks for the purposes of avoiding any redundancy. The first five cards going in are all functionally similar. They just offer different color mana. So let's just do the whole kit and caboodle here. And yes, it is going to be the basic cave, um, not series, um, basic... What are we talking about here? Um, cycle. There we go. We got, we got the cycle of basic. I'm sorry. The cycle of common caves from Ixalan, the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. They all do exactly the same thing. Each of them come into play tapped. Each taps for one mana of their perspective colors. So we got white, blue, black, red, and green. And each has an activated ability for four generic mana and the color that it produces to pay, tap, and sacrifice. And then we get to discover four. We can only activate this ability as a sorcery. And what discover four basically means is that we, we just exile cards from the top of our library until we exile a non-land card that costs four less mana. And then we cast it without paying its mana value. Value. We put any other cards revealed this way on the on the bottom of our library in a random order. This will allow us to get some removal for our commander because we have so many spells in the build that allow us to sacrifice a creature in order to draw cards and get some other benefits as well. If we don't have that in our hand and the board is starting to look a little bit, I don't know, not good for us, we can sacrifice one of our lands and hopefully draw one of those spells. We've got the Hidden Courtyard, the Hidden Cataract, the Hidden Necropolis, the Hidden Volcano, and the Hidden Nursery. This is the Hidden Cycle. And yes, the lands do come into play tapped, but if you are familiar with this build, we have ways of having permanents enter the battlefield untapped. We won't have as many of those by the time this video ends. But yes, Amulet of Vigor is in the 99 of this build. With those five lands going in, we're going to replace some cards that just have not performed very well throughout this deck's play history. In addition to some cards that, let's face it, with us sacrificing our commander like nobody's business, <sighs> losing these cards over and over and over again almost, just almost wants us to not sacrifice the child at all. Well, we need to remove all doubt because the child has to hit the yard. With that being said, the hidden cycle is going in and those five cards are going to replace... Nylea's Intervention. This was a sorcery for X and two green mana. We picked one of the following two modes. Either we searched our library for up to X land cards, revealed them, and then put them into our hand, or Nylea's Interve Intervention deals twice X damage to each creature with flying. We really didn't need to worry about the second mode because, ahem, we have a commander that will destroy almost everything. So we were really just playing this for the first mode, and we really don't need to have this card in our hand when we have so many other draw card spells we're really building this deck to be able to have a land drop every single turn which over the course of a long game for us child of alara players we will out resource our opponents because they most likely will not be able to play a land every turn and we will so nylea's intervention is out because honestly i'd rather have a land Behind that, we have Explore the Underdark. Here was a sorcery for four and a green mana. <sighs> we searched our library for up to two basic land cards and or gates and then put them onto the battlefield tapped. We also take the initiative, but this is not an initiative deck, so that didn't really help us very much. We got to take the first step into the uh, dungeon, of course, but after that, we had no other initiative 
synergies. So what we're really looking at here is a sorcery speed spell for five mana to get us two lands. And they're either basics or they're gates. Well, as a rule of thumb, particularly for this build, we'll go two mana for every one land. Here it's 2.5 mana for a land. So explore the Underdark. We're going to take care of you. You are out and one of those hiddens are going in. As stated earlier, we are going to have a little, we're going to have a slightly, a slight reduction in our ability to have a permanence come into play untapped. Here with our Chelos, the original goal was to make sure that the lands that we're putting into play can be, can come into play untapped so that we can use our mana right away. Well, unfortunately, this also helped out our opponents. And if you are a fan of MTG Burgeoning, we strive and try to very stringently build decks that do not help out our opponents. This is a symmetrical effect, and it's going to help our opponents as much as it helps us. And plus, it dies as soon as we sacrifice the child. So our Chelos, you have to come out. Yep, I know what you're already saying. You're already saying in the comment section, you're in a land deck where you have more than two-thirds of the 99 lands and you're taking out Azusa. Why are you doing that? The basic reason, and it's very simple, Azusa is only good until we sacrifice our commander. Once our commander is gone, Azusa hits the yard and then we pretty much invested the three mana to get maybe a couple extra lands into play over the course of a couple of turns. Maybe a few, maybe four. I mean, how many are we talking about here? If it's in our opening hand, yeah, that's great. But do I want to draw this in the middle of the game? No, I either want to land in my hand or something that's going to help us to sacrifice our commander so that we can blow up the world. I know it sounds crazy, but Azusa does not play very friendly in this Child of Alara deck. If she's in our opening hand, fantastic. If not, the child don't want none. And then lastly, we gonna for the for the cycle of the hidden uh, caves over there, we're gonna take out the Guild Summit. This was an enchantment for two and a blue mana, and when it ETB'd, we may tap any number of untapped gates we control to draw a card for each gate tapped this way. And then whenever a gate enters the battlefield under our control, we were to draw a card, which is a pretty nice effect, particularly in a build that, let's face it, it is a strong gate build. However, what's happening here is, once more, if we were to get this permanent out in the early to the middle portions of the game, that's pretty good. Later in the game would be much, much better because then our board is inundated with lands. However, it's a one-shot... I mean, in all honesty, this is most likely a one-shot spell because once the child dies, this is getting destroyed. And I have to tell you... That child dies a lot. It really does. And as long as we continue to play our lands, we'll never have to worry about the, the commander tax involved, which is the whole scope of this build. Yes, the Guild Summit could put some burst card draw into our hand, but I gotta be honest with you, sacrificing one of those hidden courtyards to get us to to in order to um Geez, in order to discover four, if we have the child on our side of the battlefield, that most likely is going to yield one of those sacrifice spells to put some cards into our hand and we blow up the world. We don't really want to sacrifice that and end up hitting guild summits because, let's face it, we've invested five mana, all of most of which is going to come from our lands, and we're sacrificing a land. And if we discover into guild summit, it could come down and we may not even have any gates to tap. Then it just becomes, can we play a gate to draw a card? Well, how long is it going to be in play? Because the child is heading to the graveyard. So a lot of consideration went into getting rid of those five spells, but to make way for five lands that are going to interact with our commander better, overall, this is going to help out the deck. And if it doesn't, well, then we'll be right back here for another episode of the Up and Up series. All right, we got a few more cards going in, so let's get started. The next card going in, oh, it is Promising Vein. So if we're going to add five caves, let's keep adding some caves to get a different kind of land subtype. Here we tap for a colorless mana. 
Or we can pay a generic mana, tap and sacrifice the Promising Vein to search our library for a basic land, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. Of course, that basic land is going to be a forest or the only basic lands in this build, but still, the cave is going to come into play. It's going to help us. All right, with the cave, I'm sorry, with the Promising Vein going in, it is going to replace a basic forest. Don't worry, we have enough forests to go around. We're going to get one land for another, so the basic forest coming out is not going to hamper our mana ability. Remember, check out the deck list. We're not hurting for colored mana. After Promising Vein going in, the next cave coming in, it is Forgotten Monument, another cave. Taps for a colorless, but gives other co caves we control the Mana Confluence ability, which is we can tap a cave we control, pay one life, and add one mana of any color. Very, very nice spell here. That's why we're going hard with the caves and Forgotten Monument, if needed to help straighten out and fix our mana, could be one of the cards we target early in the game. With Forgotten Monuments going in, it's going to replace, yep, another forest. But don't worry, we've got plenty of forests in the build. We're not going to be without forests. All right, the next cave going into this build, it is the Sunken Citadel. Here it comes into play tapped, but again, Amulet of Vigor. And as it enters, we choose a color. We can tap this to add one mana of the chosen color, or we can tap this to add two mana of the chosen color, but we can only spend this mana to activate abilities of land sources. The last time we had an up and up series episode with the Child of Alara, we upgraded some man lands. So this can definitely help to pay the activated ability costs of those lands. And it's also helping to fix our mana. Notice a little bit of a trend here. We're sacrificing a little bit of our basic forest for ways in which to diversify a land base that, in all honesty, really only needs to hit those colors once, and then we're set. With Sunken Citadel going in, it's going to replace... Oh, surprise, surprise, it's another basic forest. All right, the next card going in, it is Echoing Deeps, another cave. Here we may have Echoing Deeps enter the battlefield tapped as a copy of any land card in a graveyard, except it's a cave in addition to its other types. And we can tap this to add one, one colorless mana. Very, very sneaky good card here. Note, it targets any land card in a graveyard. Could be a fetch land, could be a dark depths, could be a whole heck of a lot of things. Echoing Deeps is going to provide a lot of versatility to this Child of Alara build. And with that cave going in, it's going to replace... Oh, see, you thought it was going to be a forest. It's not a forest. It's the Mystifying Maze. This is a land that taps for a colorless mana. I'm sorry, tap, yeah, taps for a colorless mana. Or we paid four generic mana. We tapped it and exiled target attacking creature and opponent... Con oh, let's try this again. We pay four mana into this, tap it, and then we exile target attacking creature and opponent controls. At the beginning of the next end step, we return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. This was a great way to make sure that our opponents did not decide to send any creatures at us, particularly any big old creature tokens, because they would never get them back. However, in order to strengthen the little cave sub-theme that we got going on there, that we got going on here in this video, we are going to slightly weaken our protective lands. And after looking at those lands, Mystifying Maze seems to be the weakest of the bunch. All right, the next cave and the last cave going in, this will be cave number 10. It is Pit of Offerings. It enters the battlefield tapped, and when it does enter the battlefield, we exile up to three target cards from graveyards. A nice little piece of graveyard chicanery. Very, very nice ability here. It taps for a colorless mana, or it taps to add one mana of any of the exile card's colors. Again, we're doing a little bit of mana fixing here, but we're also interacting with our opponent's graveyards, which, let's face it, we're playing Commander. That's probably a, ne that's probably a necessity. <laughs> All right. 
For Pit of Offerings going in, it's going to replace Care Keep. Here we add a legendary land tap for a colorless, or we can pay one under red mana and tap it to create a 0-1 red kobold, creature token named Kobolds of Care Keep. Here, the tokens, they were okay, chump blockers, 0-1s, but... You know, with savvy deck building with all of the evasion, trample, and then you got, you know, Manus and flying. Uh, it just seems like it's not hitting as many of the high points as we want it to. And I do think overall Pit of Offerings is going to give this build overall a bigger impact than what Care Keep can do. And if we do end up missing the creature token production of this legendary land... Like we said earlier in this build, then we will revisit it and we will put it back in. All right, and for our last edition in this Child of Alara up and up video, it's going to be, which cave is it going to be? Which cave is it going to be? Oh, it's not a cave at all. It's the Black Gate. It is a gate and we've got a lot of them in this build. And I got to be honest with you, MTGBC, we are now at the point where we can start picking and choosing the gates that go in and not just have to include every single gate just because there aren't enough of them to make an impact. So with a little bit of foreshadowing, let's talk about the black gate. The black gate enters the battlefield. We may pay three life. And if we don't, it enters the battlefield tapped. So this isn't a shock land. This is like an electrocution land. Those three points of damage I'm sorry, paying that three life, damage and life, they are different. Well, three life, if we need the mana, we do it. If not, not a big deal. But let's not just think that this land is all about mana. It does turn sideways for one black mana. However, we can pay one generic and one black and tap the black gate to choose a player with the most life or tied for the most life and then target creature can't be blocked by creatures that player controls this turn also note this does not say activate only as a sorcery so with a little bit of politicking at the edh table we could end up taking out an opponent with one of our opponent's creatures or if needed and that's one of the main ways we win this game we can just turn this bad boy sideways and use that on our own commander the black gate is a gate so we will be able to fetch it into our hand or into play with any of the various fetch creature i'm sorry fetch gate spells that are in the 99 of this build all right with the black gate going in and the aforementioned foreshadowing about being able to pick and choose which gates go in in mtg burgeoning's humble opinion the gate that's going to come out the weakest of the gates that were in the build to make room for the black gate it's going to be heap gate here at tap for a colorless we can pay a generic mana and tap it for one mana of any color now why are we going to tap two lands for one mana why are we going to do that? We don't need to do that. We're playing a land every single turn. We're casting spells to put multiple lands into play. We don't need to tap two lands to add one color of mana. Come on. And the other ability, we can pay one and tap this and tap an untapped gate we control to create a treasure token. Now, why are we going to tap two lands to create a treasure token that if we don't use it by the time the child dies, it goes bye-bye? No, no. The heat gate is coming out. The black gate is going in. And there you have it, MTGBC. 11 brand new lands going into the 99 of our Child of Alara build. And 11 cards coming out. Let me know your thoughts about these swaps in the comment section below. This is MTG Burgeoning. A yo channel for all things magic. <laughs>